Um, I'm Matt Barton. I'm the curator of recorded sound at the uh, NAVCC in Culpeper, part of the Library of Congress. And I'm doing this with Tom Fine, who's been doing uh, demonstrations downstairs with Robin Wyatt of Emory Cook's binaural stereo system. And that's what uh, this uh, part of the program is about, is the early days of stereo, which, as I was saying, could be quite inspiring and at times quite silly. Uh, so we'll have a little bit of both. I mean, this is just kind of a, a potpourri. We're not trying to rewrite the history books or anything here, but just to uh, bring you some highlights and a few of them you might consider low lights, but I think you'll find it all entertaining. I'm going to start in the mono era, however, because uh, recording was mono, uh, you know, until really until there were experiments, but really until the 1950s. Uh, uh, but it was mono for a long time, and they got very good at recording in mono. So I'm going to just play a few examples from uh, the 30s on, uh, give you an idea of where mono was at at the time that stereo was just getting developed. Uh, first one's from 1935, or maybe it's 36, I forget which. This is Louis Armstrong with the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra, uh, Swing That Music, one of my favorite records. And uh, we're very fortunate in that the version I'm going to play you is not from a uh, 78 issued at the time, but from the metal uh, mother, uh, one of the metal mastering parts. It's a nice, clean one. Rob Cristarella, who's uh, not in the room right now but doing quadraphonic demonstrations, transferred this a number of years ago. And um, let's just hear it. Such a thrill, my feet won't keep still when they swing that music. Rhythm like that puts me in a trance. You can't blame me from wanting to dance. From what I understand, it's simply grand to play in a band when they swing that music. I'm so happy as can be when they swing that music for me. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, this is also the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra, uh, without Louis Armstrong and probably without any of the musicians from the earlier recording, it's more than 20 years later. This is the uh, orchestra that Jimmy led after uh, Tommy's death a couple of months earlier. And um, this is, as I say, from early 1957, 
NBC was still archiving recordings to Lacquer Disc, and uh, uh, Presto, the Presto Company had made the final refinements, I think, to their 1955 model. And even though uh, tape was pretty much universal at this point, NBC was doing it this way and making good recordings. Uh, try and find the, was there a want here? May Orchestra, directed by Sam Donahue, takes a stand, so we got us a real full first. Right now, Jimmy Dorsey picks a year, 1928 to be exact, and the song of that year, exactly 28 years ago last night. The cabaret jazz bands were playing this one for the dancers. Remember, Sweet Sue. Um, two quick notes about that recording. That was made at about 10.15 in the morning on New Year's Day, and Jimmy and the band had participated in uh, NBC's New Year's Eve broadcast. Uh, there's, they were, that's live from the Statler uh, Hotel. Uh, <clears throat> that was live from the Statler Hotel. They came on at about uh, 12.30 after Guy Lombardo had played Old Lang Syne, and they managed to do that at 10.15 in the morning. And the other aside is that Jimmy's playing beautifully there. He would die less than six months later. Now we'll go to um, our 
arguably a uh, highlight of the early stereo era, certainly an entertaining one, um, but a good example of how silly you could get. There was a label called Bel Canto in those days, and um, they, <laughs> where is this? Ah, thank you. Uh, like most other labels of the time, they rushed out a stereo demonstration album. And um, this one on one side had uh, tracks from several of their early stereo albums, and on the other side it had what they called a stereo tour of San Francisco. Uh, it only took them about 12 and a half minutes to tour San Francisco, but um, that's the, uh, the magic of recording and the magic of stereo, I suppose. Uh, we're not going to play the whole thing, but just a, uh, a few minutes so you can get the idea of uh, what these things could be like. So here we go. Jack Wagner, and I'm going to take you on a stereophonic tour of the city of Los Angeles. Gee, it's almost time for the first race at Hollywood Park. Let's pull in right here and see if we can catch it. can tear up these tickets. Even in stereophonic sound, you still have to have the right horse. Let's get back into the car. I want to take you over to the Grace Memorial Church of God and Christ to hear a pretty exciting sound. And he drives around like that for another uh, 10 or 12 minutes. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jay Bruder asked me to announce the year. That was late 58, possibly early 1959. And there, oh, what? That was late 58, early 59. And um, there were a lot of these very gimmicky records, people walking back and forth, cars driving around, uh, lots of train records. Um, uh, but uh, we'll go from the ridiculous to the more sublime I think eventually, <laughs> and I'll bring up Tom Fine.
Hi there, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about early stereo music recordings and show you where, where things went. Um, I, don't, I don't really have time to go into the history of all this, but it's, it's worth read. It's quick quick summary. In the 1930s, Bell Labs and Western Electric developed a stereo disc recorder that used a single groove. Around the same time in England, EMI under Alan Bloomline also developed a single groove stereo recording system. And in fact, Bloomline's patent is, is good reading because it pretty much um, tells, tells out the history of you know, what, how we play records today, how we listen to things in stereo. Um, but the point of pride, Bell Labs did get there first with a working system. Um, Hollywood was interested in multi-channel and um, quote-unquote immersive sound going back to Fantasia. So, you know, what's, what's new is old again, or vice versa. Um, downstairs at four, uh, Robin Wyatt and I will play some Emery Cook two groove stereo records. So there was, there was a parallel um, history of development of having a channel in each groove and having two cartridges and um, basically two mo mono channels. Um, but I'm going to get you into the stereo era now with, with commercial releases. Um, Matt did um, the um, the demo records. So there, this was a whole genre of uh, trains going by, um, cannons exploding, big organs in, you know, churches with like a microphone way in the back so you could hear the whole cathedral and all this. Um, record companies got more serious about this in the mid '50s because um, the commercial the commercial market opened up first with two-track stereo tapes, and then in 1958 with the stereo LP, which I think most of us around here grew up with stereo LPs. Like the, this was what we listened to when we were kids. Um, so what the record companies needed to build up a catalog of, of recordings to have ready for the LP. So they started in earnest in the mid 50s, the major companies. I want to play you a recording that um, RCA Victor did in uh, 1954. And this is two microphones in Chicago, and it um, went directly to a to two-track tape to an RCA um, tape machine that was going at 30 inches per second. And I would say, I would call this probably the earliest stereo high-fidelity recording. And uh, let us go here. Crank it up. RCA Living Stereo, Mercury Living Presence, um, DECA in the UK were early with, with really high quality stereo recordings of classical music. But what really caught the public's ear with stereo is pop. And I'm going to play you a cut from the first stereo gold record, which was called Persuasive Percussion. And the, this, is, this introduced an, an effect 
that people now call ping pong stereo, where something was going from speaker to speaker. And, you know, the early adopters of stereo loved this idea like, hey, look, it's in the right, it's in the left. And, uh, you know, this was a way to show off the system. And uh, I think there's, an, there's a term in high fidelity called, called WAF, wife acceptance factor. So, you know, adding speakers always has a low wife acceptance factor in the living room. And these guys, this is a way to justify the extra speaker. Hey, listen to this. Um, my father happened to have recorded this record, so I know a little bit about how they did it. It's kind of, it's kind of cool how they, they did the ping pong effect. The recording console was very primitive. It basically had key switches to assign something to left or to right. So they would, they would group the... Um, the people around the microphones that they wanted to switch. It, it only had 12 inputs, so the, the maximum microphones they could use were 12. They had that, my father's studio was an old ballroom, so they could set them out in this reverberant room, and uh, they would put the, the, the instruments they needed in a certain channel around a microphone, and then in the control room, they would sit with the arranger and the score, and there would be up to six hands on the mixer, um, usually the engineer, the producer, and the arranger, and they would go in rhythm, switching um, microphones to different channels to get that ping pong effect. So this is, um, this is, I'm, I'm, Uh, that's late, that's 1958 pop music, and uh, um, it was, uh, that, that record, like I said, was extremely successful. It sold millions of copies by the end of the LP era, and it was in print through the 70s. Um, I want to, I want to play you a, a different approach to stereo, which is more, a more serious approach, less of a demo of the speakers, but this is how a good pop recording sounded in stereo. This is Peggy Lee from uh, 1960, I believe, and um, this was this was done at Capitol Studios, and uh, this this is like the, the, you'd call this like the golden era of pop music. Zero. Get your chin up off the floor. 
Mister, you can be a hero. You can open any door. There's nothing to it but to do it. You gotta have heart. Miles and miles and miles of heart. Oh, it's fine to be a genius, of course. But keep that old horse before the cart. First, you gotta have heart. Broadway fans might recognize that from Damn Yankees. Um, you get into the, the rock era, and this, the use of stereophony in the studio is much, gets much more creative. Um, more, more intended as part of the music, I would say, not more creative. Um, the, the classic example is the Beatles, so I figured, got to play something from the Beatles, got to play something from Revolver, because that was the first time they really started using the stereophony as a thing, and um, play tax man. One, two, three, four, one, two. Let me tell you how it will be. There's one for you, 19 for me. Cause I'm the tax man. Yeah! So I, I played the Beatles for a reason, because I'm surprised no one raised their hand and called me on what I said about the stereo mix, because there's actually a lot of, in the Beatles fan world, most people who grew up with the Beatles didn't hear that song that way, unless they were a stereophile and their dad had a stereo system at home or something like that. Um, the, uh, the Beatles' original hits were 
on, on mono radio, and they were in mono generally. And people my age, I grew up in the 80s, and we were listening to the, the only thing we had were the Capitol Stereo LPs. So the second generation of Beatles fans grew up with a different way of listening to the Beatles than the first generation. Now they, um, Apple Records reissued the Beatles mono albums, and it's kind of interesting to listen. Um, you know, I looked on Spotify, I don't see the mono albums on Spotify, which is pretty interesting. Um, it's, it's worth listening to the mono versions of, of everything up through Sgt. Pepper because the mixes are completely different. Those mono mixes are what the Beatles actually approved. And, um, it's, and it's, it's different how the song, like if, if you grew up listening carefully to the stereo mixes like I did, okay, you know where every sound is, right? You know all these pieces of the songs from where the sound is because it's kind of a thin mix. They only, they were working with four tracks and it's a, and then they were putting it, putting it together on mono. It's a big, thick, the song is there, right? That's what stands out. With stereo, the sound is more what stands out, like particular things like the guitar solo over there or the, um, the cowbell. That's all just part of the mix with the mono. So anyway, that was my point about the Beatles. Are we running out of time? Uh, we're, we've got about 10 minutes. Or so. Oh, okay. I was just going to add that you know, with with uh, those mono mixes and Sergeant, hearing Sergeant Pepper in mono for the first time was a revelation to me. A copy came into a store that I was working in in the early 90s, and the owner got excited because he'd never seen one either. And we put it on, and we were just looking at each other uh, because the, the different. It, it's first of all, it's an album you've heard hundreds of times. Uh, so, you know, you're going to notice the differences right away. But also, it's uh, not quite sure how to put it, but in some ways it's a more musical mix in that the effects and extra musical sounds are falling cleanly on the beat or they're offsetting other things. It's much more apparent what they're there for. You know, they aren't just, you know, uh, part of this very broad mix, this unusual sonic stew, but, you know, they have you know, very musical purposes. Yeah. I, I, that, that's, that was exactly my feeling when I heard the albums the first time in, in mono. I was like, oh, these are, you know, because it's not, this is great sound. Oh, these are really great songs, and this is, this is really cool how the song works. Um, I feel the same way about um, a lot of the Elvis Presley recordings into the 60s, because they've put out these, uh, these R RCA things where they have, like, the, the band over there and Elvis over there, or Elvis here, the Jordan Airs over there, and the rest of the band over there. It's actually better just to hear them all mixed together, which is how they originally did it. Now, stereo advanced, though, and stereo techniques advanced. I'm going to play you what um, many people, many rock fans probably consider one of the penultimate uh, stereo records, which is Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Um, this was never intended for mono. This was intended for stereo. The, the way the sound was designed, the way the sound was spread out, the way it was engineered, even the way it was recorded, like how, how they built this from 16 tracks and um, many guitar overdubs, you know, different sound effects. This was intended to be heard in stereo. So I'll play the hit from it, Money, but the whole album is, is like, I'm sure uh, most, most people who like rock music know the album well, so, you know, I don't, I don't need to say it's it's a it's a cool experience and you know think about the first time you heard it on a good system or the first time you heard it through good headphones
So that, that gets us through the pop music, and I think Matt has one more thing, and then we'll do Q&A. Yeah, so this is just to bring us back to earth, quite literally. Um, this is a recording made by Jim Metzner, who uh, hosted, still uh, hosts a podcast, but until recently was a uh, regular radio show, Pulse of the Planet, and before that, Sounds of Science. Jim has recorded all over the world, and this is a really exceptional stereo recording that he made, I think, actually, I'll have to check with him, I think it was to DAT in the 90s, in the Pantanal, uh, Brazilian wetlands. And he calls this the Dawn Chorus. And it's, uh, you know, simply what he heard, what he captured. There was no, no mixing. It's, you know, just what you hear is what he got. So let's try this. Oh, <laughs> 
Okay, Don Corris from Council Now. And uh, if you have any questions, Jay here is our mic runner, so just raise your hand. First, I wanted to share with you, I concur about mono. I'm a very big mono fan, uh, and uh, particularly going into the high fidelity era when you could quote unquote hear everything. Uh, I also grew up, as Thomas said, with the stereo albums uh, of the Beatles, and then a friend played for me uh, the direct-to-disc master transfer in mono of Sgt. Pepper, and I was hearing things that I had never heard before, I actually feel that the mono, my own opinion, I actually prefer the mono mix when I do the stereo mix of, uh, of Sgt. Pepper. Um, I was wondering from a repository point of view, have any of the major record labels entrusted the library storage facilities on loan or just permanent storage of any of the metal parts from their catalogs? Well, Universal Music Group, um, we have the uh, DECA metal parts and lacquers, about a mile of them. Um, it's not, it's everything that they had. And mind you, this was, the, the, none of this was stored in Iron Mountain. Uh, none, it was stored in Iron Mountain, not in Los Angeles. So nothing, you know. A, a lot of the um, uh, recordings, you'll see lists of, you know, of artists whose tapes were lost. And... Uh, Sometimes they are simply listing artists who actually only recorded to disc for DECA. Um, and what was lost were tape transfers that were made later on. So artists, you know, Billie Holiday, Sidney Bechet, there are a number of you know, artists of the 30s and 40s um, where the, the master, you know, uh, the masters survive. It's just that the tapes were lost, tapes that were made well after the fact. A lot, a lot was lost, but you know, not nearly as much as uh, people think. <laughs> yeah. The uh, RCA example that you played. Uh, so was that released on just reel to reel then? And did they do a re-release on record later, or or you said fifty four, right? Yes. So that's a good question, Nick. Um, so in nineteen fifty. Late 1955, R RCA was first among the majors to get two-track reel-to-reels out. And Zarathustra and also Ein Heldenleben that was recorded at the same session were among their first two tapes that they got out. Zarathustra was also one of their first LP records in 1958, stereo LP records. Um, Heldenleben came out later as, as a Camden uh, stereo record. Um, so, um, yeah, they got that out early uh, on LP. Now, the interesting thing is, you know, they put this out, of course, this was a major session with Fritz Reiner and the Chicago Symphony, so they put that right out on mono LP. And, in fact, in a demo I did at the AES, I went back and forth between the stereo and mono Heldenleben because it was a completely different setup. That, in 1954, RCA had a different engineer and a different producer for the stereo, and the mono was the, the mono was the thing that was the money maker. They had to get that out into the market, so they um, that was their main focus. Um, Jack Pfeiffer went with a guy named John Crawford and made the mono, I mean the stereo. And it, like I said, it was two microphones at, at that time in those early sessions, direct to the to the RCA 30 ips two track tape machine. But that was, that was they, they had commercial aspirations by then, but that was a minor, a minor thing for them. Yeah. So um, the 54 recordings you're talking about was with Jack Pfeiffer. And who was the engineer? I think John Crawford, or Leslie Crawford. Leslie. Les Le Leslie Crawford. Um, Leslie Chase. Leslie Chase. Chase. Okay. Thanks, That's Lon. Right. <laughs> Lon knows. Yep, Leslie Chase. That's right. So most people don't know, but Jack Pfeiffer actually was an electrical engineer, and he, decided, he, he started at RCA as a design engineer in 49 or 50 or something like that. And um, I believe in 57, was that Dick Moore and uh, Lou Layton? Yeah. That would have done it. 
and then from 62 on was Tony Salvatore. Yeah. It was basically the, uh, the era of engineers that went. Yes, because Lou, Lou Layton died very unfortunately on the, on the, the bus home. Uh, at, or at a bus stop, I think. Yeah. It's awful. But just a comment on that. Yeah. Jack Pfeiffer also did a lot of contributions to quadraphonic as well. Yeah. When they started doing those recordings, many times they had a mono control room and a stereo control room as well. I say this because Tony Salvatore was my, one of my early mentors, and so I know some of the stories about it. But it was really a fascinating period, a very exciting time in recording with such tremendous musicians and, and technology progress. Yes, yeah. yeah. One comment I should make about the early stereo era um, with classical music is that that happened to be a time where there were really good conductors walking the earth and really good orchestras. So all the labels, the major labels, had in their stable really, really good content that they could, that they could get out on stereo records early. So it was, you know, it was a, a good confluence of factors in the mid to late 50s for, for this to take off. However, I should also say that until the mid 60s, retailers stocked dual inventory of stereo and mono records. Mono records far outsold stereo records because they cost a dollar less and most people didn't have stereo systems at home until the retailers told the record companies we're not going to stock dual inventory and the record companies were like, oh, well, we're going to keep the higher priced items. So the mono inventory went away of circa 1966 time and, and that's when um, stereo became more dominant. Um, that also was around the time, late 60s, was when the, the Japanese solid state equipment started coming into the US market. And a lot of, by then, a lot of people who were into a home listening system, they had worn out their 1950s hi fi system. The tubes had finally burned all the wires off the sockets and stuff. And they, they upgraded, they, I won't say upgraded, they updated to, um, the, the early solid state stuff, which was all stereo. And then, and then stereo FM, of course, came about in the early 60s and really took hold in the later 60s, early 70s. And um, that's when stereo kind of became mainstream. Also, the kind of rock music, starting with the, the Beatles and some other groups, where you get into the psychedelic era um, where the stereophony becomes important and you know having sounds go around your head and that, that sort of thing, um, that helped um, mainstream stereophony. But really up into the 70s, radio stations demanded mono compatible. Um, most of the European broadcasting was still mono. Um, the, you know, the, the stereo, I, I would say, was absolutely mainstream and ubiquitous by the time I started buying records in the late 70s. But it took until about then for it to be like, there, nobody was making anything in mono and no, nobody was buying anything in mono at that point, except AM radio. And everything was mono compatible. So, it would, so the hits would play on AM radio anyway. Yes. Um, yeah. <clears throat> what can you tell me about uh, phase four stereo and like how does that fit into this oh. kind of discussion? Like what's, what differentiates it? Well, so, so once the command persuasive percussion and provocative percussion were go sold so many copies, everybody wanted to do that kind of pop music. So um, Mercury did Perfect Presence and, and um, P35F or F35D when they did it on 35 millimeter. In England, um, what was the guy, do you know the guy's name with, with Phase 4, the producer? They, they had an American producer and they got this idea, we're going to close mic everything and we're going to put it through a big console and we're going to make classical music sound like pop and we're going to make pop music sound like command. And they were very successful with it. You know, they, they, they would take like light classics or, you know, something like, for instance, Antal Dorati had recorded for Mercury and he went and recorded a bunch of other stuff for Phase 4. And, uh, um, so it, it, phase four was interesting because they had a pop aspect to it and they had a classical aspect to it. And the classical aspect was that they were using more microphones than most, most of the, I think almost any other company at that time. And they were getting 
they were mixing it to bring out certain details in the in the score to make a point of within the sound system and um, which is the opposite of like a deck a tree where you set it and forget it and uh, um, but with the pop stuff they did all kinds of things they did uh, you know guns shooting can you know they they, they they did like military exercises <laughs> they did all kinds of things yeah. they also I think the uh uh, stereo albums, you know, for the first eight or ten years, you know, they would have those wonderful diagrams. Yes. Which, yeah, I think they were just, just to make you drool in the record store. Uh, but phase four really just took it to <laughs> new places with all these drawings of instruments and lines going every which way. Um, you know, I forgot the name art. of the engineer, the producer, too. He was an American guy, though. He was like a flashy American guy. And they, uh, and, and, you know, De DECA was a very creative label. Like, you know, they're, 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 I, I always look at with the British labels, I look at EMI as being kind of stodgy, like sort of like Columbia in the U.S. But um, uh, DECA was, was more like Mercury was in the U.S. They were adventurous. They tried new things. They, they had a smaller crew, so there were fewer hands touching everything. It was less, less corporate, I guess is a way to put it. So they, so they were like, yeah, sure, we'll try this. Yes, Mara. Yes. Was it Arthur? I don't know. Uh, just my memory is that his, his last name was Lily. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. So, anything else? All right. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, <laughs>